January 2020. Putting the previous year behind us, we launched a new decade with fervor, hoping this would be a bright new beginning. In 2019, the political landscape was tumultuous at home and around the world. Economies were unstable, tensions escalated. But as New Year's streamers were swept away and resolutions already cast aside, many of us looked ahead to 2020, looking forward with optimism to a brand new year, a year that would bring change. The outbreak of mystery pneumonia cases in Wuhan began last month. It's a new type of coronavirus. South Korea is the first country outside of China to report a suspected case. There are now more new cases of coronavirus being reported outside China. France was the first country in Europe to confirm cases of coronavirus. Now it's the first to record a fatality. A deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. An elderly man in British Columbia has died as a result of the disease. Change arrived in the form of a virus, first identified in Wuhan, China, and surreptitiously spreading throughout the world. It became obvious something was seriously wrong. Tonight, the Chinese city of Wuhan and nearby towns locked down. No trains, flights, or mass transit. On January 23rd, the Chinese government quarantined tens of millions of people, an event unlike anything seen in human history. On February 11th, the World Health Organization announced an official name for the disease. The World Health Organization has officially called it the coronavirus. COVID-19. Co for corona, vi for virus, D for disease, and 19 because it started last year. This is the story of a small and determined group of doctors and scientists. Their courage, innovation, persistence, and unrelenting attack on COVID-19. This is a story of hope. Welcome to Pillar of Hope. This podcast explores the groundbreaking discovery of an innovative use of a common drug that may significantly decrease the risk of COVID-19 complications in patients, a drug that can save lives. But more than the study itself, this podcast reaches deep into the hearts of the people who put their families on hold, their lives intently focused on a solution. You'll hear their frustrations, their concerns, their gratitude, and without fail, their hope. Leading the charge, let's meet Dr. Michelle Schulzberg and learn of her determination to change the course of the world's most deadly virus. I'm a hematologist at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Canada, which is affiliated with the University of Toronto. And our research institute is called the Lee Cushing Knowledge Institute. I'm the division head of hematology oncology within the Department of Medicine. I'm also the medical director of our coagulation laboratory. My focus in hematology is on bleeding and clotting, and I have been working as a hematologist now for essentially a decade. I became a doctor because I was fascinated with human biology when I was in high school. And I remember distinctly the class where we dissected a fetal pig, and I felt as if I was learning some sort of untold magical secret. It was a really eye-opening experience for me. I guess when I look back now, I think it's because the idea of being involved in the healing process has integrated itself into my identity. I think many physicians don't think of medicine as a career or a job. They think of it as a vocation. It's just something that spoke to me, and, and I wanted to be able to help people. I'm directly inspired by my patients and my clinical work. My work is linked to the knowledge gaps and the care gaps that identify my clinical practice. So I see patients in clinic, a question might arise, and I find myself scratching my head and saying, oh my gosh, I don't know how to answer that question. And then I design a study to answer it. It's really satisfying. The winter winds swirled outside St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. Life inside carried on with its usual cacophony of sounds. Most of us, with the exception of the science community, thought we were safe from the spread of this virus. Inside, 
Dr. Schulzberg began to see a pattern developing, one that signaled a problem with the blood. Well in advance of the international medical community, Michelle suspected the link between deaths from COVID-19 and abnormal blood clotting. I became acutely aware in January. Uh, in January, I don't think that I knew, I don't think any of us knew, the scale of the epidemic and ultimate pandemic. It was more so at the end of February that it became clear that this is coming and this is hitting and we don't have enough personal protective equipment. I remember calling my colleagues who are dentists and reaching out to my family members in various parts of the country and telling them that it's coming and we don't have enough masks. We need goggles and face shields and, and gloves. And I remember those conversations so clearly because every time I would speak to somebody new, there was disbelief. And they said, what, really? No, it's not coming, is it really? And we said, yes, and we don't have enough. That was really hard um, and felt like a very desperate time and a very scary time. I don't think at the beginning of this that I had any idea that I was going to be a COVID researcher. Once it became clear at the end of February that patients with COVID-19 were developing blood clots and that this potentially was implicated in the pathophysiologic mechanism or the pathway to severe illness and death, that I realized this is what I do. My focus is bleeding and clotting, and my focus in research is clinical trials. I can help. I'm usually inspired by a big problem, which often has many elements pertaining to social determinants of health, and that's something that gets me really riled up, maybe a bit angry, and then excited and inspired and, and pushes me. This is a bit different in that the inspiration came a little bit out of fear because we didn't know what we were doing. So this is like a wide open field, but also it felt like somebody was saying, you can do this, do it. But if you're gonna do it, fully commit and do it now. So yeah, it did feel like somebody was either knocking on my door or maybe shaking me. <laughs> I don't even fully remember making a conscious decision. I just did it. Seeing the need to act quickly, Schulzberg brought her findings to the attention of Dr. Peter Uni, internationally renowned Swiss-Canadian hematologist and clinical researcher, who is the director of the Applied Health Research Center at St. Michael's Hospital. I'm really fortunate at my hospital and at my university to have amazing mentors, and one of my research mentors is Peter Uni. Peter Uni is an incredible clinical epidemiologist. He's uh, one of the most highly cited clinical epidemiologists in the world. I think he's either first or second, like it's really crazy. But most importantly, he's also one of the most humble people that you'll ever meet. And he's incredibly kind and generous, but he's just also kind of off the charts, brilliant. So I reached out to him and I connected with him. I knew that there was a U of T grant opportunity for half a million dollars. And I said, that'll help us get something started. And I reached out to Peter and I, I was in our guest bedroom in our house and I called Peter and I said, I have an idea. I'd like to run a clinical trial that evaluates higher dose heparin compared to lower dose standard care heparin for patients that are admitted to hospital with COVID. And I said, but Peter, do you think this is a good idea? <laughs> because he's somebody who's conducted numerous clinical trials. He's an incredible researcher. And I had this idea and I felt that I needed to do it, but I just needed to make sure that I wasn't nuts. And he said, oh my gosh, yes, this is brilliant. We have to do this. Can I be your co-principal investigator? Which almost made me drop the phone because it's kind of like, <laughs> Like I'm still have one foot in the early investigator stage, one foot in the middle, mid-stage career phase of my research career. But Peter is a senior scientist and it was incredibly validating, but also shocking to hear him say, yeah, this is a really good idea. And I believe in this so much that I want to leave this with you. So as a scientist, there's kind of no better 
stamp of approval than saying, I want to be your co-principal investigator, because that's saying this is so good that we, we've got to lead this together to make it happen. So that was really massive. I worked with Michelle for quite a while, and it's just, it's a tremendous fun to work with her. She's extremely competent. She has this uh, very, just this wonderful way of dealing with people that makes her also very successful as an investigator. But she also has a tremendous, you know, humility, you know, the pretended kind of humility that is quite prevalent in North America, real humility. And this, uh, you know, combination is just really quite irresistible, you know, uh, just, uh, just to work with her. And then she came up with this issue and it had, you know, it was something that had bugged me too. And she just said, look, we have a problem here that there seems to be, you know, uh, a disturbance of the coagulation system, etc. In, you know, especially also in small vessels. And can't we do something about that? And what she was just explaining to me was just so right spot on that I just said, okay, clear, let's do that. And if I can help you with that, you know, however I can, let me know. I'm just clearly in it and uh, let's just move on. Dr. Uni and Dr. Schulzberg began to organize a clinical research study to find a treatment. Little did they realize at the onset, the team would reach across oceans, continents, and international boundaries, connecting physicians with the singular focus of searching for a treatment for COVID-19. There was no thought of compensation. It was simply a matter of urgency. Get the job done, and done now. Time was their enemy. The problem is that this is an evolving situation. Literally every day we learn a little bit more about it. I then became connected to Mary Cushman on an email trail. And Mary Cushman is a very well-respected thrombosis researcher and clinical epidemiologist in the United States. And I had met her a year prior at a conference. I reached out to her, asked her if we could connect and go for lunch, and we did. And I thought she was an incredible person, incredibly bright, incredibly innovative. And I was particularly impressed by her work that pertained to issues of health equity and social determinants of health and whether or not there are biological differences among different racial and ethnic groups. And a lot of her work explores that and has really influenced the way that we care for patients with blood clots. So she reached out to me and with interest, which was another massive stamp of approval and still totally surprising. And I asked if she wanted to be involved in the trial and she did, which was amazing. And then she became aware of some opportunities potentially for funding through the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And she also indicated that she would be interested in adding a biorepository component to our trial where we would be collecting blood samples on patients who were admitted to hospital and who are participating in our trial so that we could understand why these people were developing blood clots and what was underlying all of this, which is obviously really crucial. It's one thing to know how to treat them, but the whole other question to say, why is this happening? And if the treatment works, why is it working? And so because of that and uh, her tremendous contributions, uh, she then became our, co our third co-principal investigator. Dr. Mary Cushman, hematologist and medical director of the Thrombosis and Hemostasis Program at the University Medical Center in Burlington, Vermont, recognized the connection between blood clotting and COVID-19 patients. It's been overwhelming. As a scientist and a physician, you feel compelled to do something about it. And especially for me living in a small town, essentially in Vermont, you know, our, our university is in Northern Vermont in a relatively rural place. It's the small college town. So, you know, I knew my best opportunity to make a great contribution was gonna be in the research side of things. Not so much in patient care because I'm a researcher mostly. And I'm not uh, an intensive care physician or a hospitalist, you know, or a primary care doc. So I, I figured that the role I could play was in research through my national relationships with other people. And it's been quite amazing, actually, because this disease causes these tremendous perturbations in the blood clotting system. And as a hematologist who takes care of patients with blood clotting disorders and who does research on 
the related biologies of why people develop abnormal blood clots like venous thrombosis or heart attack or stroke. This disease has provided this nexus where everything I've learned in my past is relevant now because I'm a stroke researcher and I'm a heart disease researcher and I'm a blood coagulation researcher and I understand all of the interconnectedness of these systems and it's all come to the fore with this disease. And so when Dr. Scholzberg emailed me about this clinical trial she was planning, I thought to myself, well, I'm not a clinical trialist, I'm an epidemiologist, but this is a hematologist disease. It's an infectious disease first and foremost, it's a virus, but everything that it does to the body is in the hematology realm, the body's response to it. And I thought we were starting to learn this, we were just starting to understand this. The scope of this pandemic was far reaching so much was unknown. News reports of COVID-19 dominated the media. Hundreds dead, thousands infected across multiple continents, millions quarantined with whole cities in lockdown. Worst hit area of Europe continues to be Italy. By mid-February, a COVID-19 biological time bomb exploded in Bergamo, Italy. 44,000 soccer fans filled the stadium. Just think of the scenes. Thousands using the same public transportation, then standing side by side, hugging, kissing, shouting, singing, and sharing drinks. Shortly after that event, Italy became the new hotspot. Like an out of control wildfire, COVID-19 cases were being recorded throughout Europe, the Middle East, and the United States. Dr. Scholzberg, she had this idea to study blood thinning treatments um, in this disease. And I said, well, I'm happy to try to help. I mean, I don't do clinical trials. You know, I don't run them at my hospital and I don't do them as a researcher, but I can help. And the next thing I know, she asked me if I would be the co-principal investigator. <laughs> I said, you know, I don't do clinical trials. <laughs> you know that, right? And she said, yeah, I know that, but people respect you and, and you can explain why it's important and so that's why I want you to help and so basically I've spent my whole career for 25 years trying not to be a clinical trialist because it's not something I really enjoy uh, in the normal times but now I am and you know we're doing uh, clinical trials so it's had a profound impact and the ability to be able to test a treatment that might help people recover without so much damage being done to their bodies it's really, there's a great promise to it in my mind. Overwhelmed by the rapid transmission rate and steady influx of patients, Michelle and her team, now consisting of three, needed help. It came from Dr. Lisa Bauman Kritzinger, a hematologic oncologist from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I was very fortunate to become involved with the rapid trial and the rapid network through Mary Cushman. So Mary Cushman is one of the uh, co-PIs of the study at University of Vermont. And what Michelle and Mary Cushman and Peter Uni were looking for is someone who would be able to take on the clinical research coordination uh, within the United States. And I've been able to lead a group of clinical researchers in the U.S. and our name is Venus. So the Venus Thromboembolism Network United States or V-E-N-U-S. And because of that group and that work, we've been able to then leverage that group in order to be involved with this and other COVID-related research. As far as the rapid trial, there have been multiple international sites that have been opened to understand how blood thinners may help prevent progression of COVID-19, lung disease, and other organ disease, as well as blood clots. Michelle's team was growing, but so was the occurrence of COVID-19. Transmissions were getting out of control and still very little was known about this virus. The hours were agonizingly long. Sleep was a luxury, yet the team inched forward with new discoveries. But with each discovery came another hurdle. The more they learned, the more they needed to test. More patients were required for the trial, more resources needed from the international medical community, and perhaps the biggest challenge, more funding. Dollars were scarce, as governments too were struggling with how to manage an out-of-control pandemic. 
The world was on edge, and soon the plug would be pulled on life as we knew it. Most days when I come home and I'll give my family an update on the number of participants that we've recruited to the trial, you know, my son is often part of the conversation. And one day he said to me, so mommy, how, how many people do you need to treat before you save them all? It's really, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's a lot to juggle. We have found our new rhythm as a family. I think that being a part of research pertaining to COVID has given me a sense of control. I don't think that it's a coincidence that I became so heavily immersed because I felt as if I was being proactive and I was doing something. And so it's probably the thing that really got me through those darkest times was saying, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure this out and I'm going to help and, and, and we can do this because I felt that we all needed hope myself included. And I felt that it was our responsibility to engage in research very rapidly. It was our responsibility uh, towards our patients, but also our responsibility towards the frontline workers who needed the answers. In our next episode, Michelle looks for ways to expand her team and receive help from more countries. Could a larger team expedite the research and assist in accessing more funding? Why is getting the much-needed fund so difficult when every hospital in the world has been using this inexpensive common drug for decades? Frustrations still don't deter Michelle's resolve. The question remains, though, how can she and her team burst through the crushing roadblocks that delay additional funding to deliver the proof of this potentially life-saving protocol to millions? This research was made possible through the generous sponsorship of our partner institutions, organizations, and grant providers, which we proudly highlight in the show notes of this podcast. Learn more about this life-saving research and how you can contribute to this ongoing trial at stmichaelsfoundation.com slash COVID Rapid Hope.